Oh, okay. before, sorry, before, before that, let me just remind everybody that this webinar will be recorded. And at the end of the presentation, uh, if you would like to raise questions or make comments, uh, please use the Q&A box and don't use the chat box. And if you would like to stay anonymous, you're welcome to do so. But it would be very helpful if you could uh, provide information in the Q&A box as to who you are. That will simply help me to pick uh, questions to put to the speaker. But if you say you would like to be anonymous, your wish will be respected. I will not read out your name or identifiable information for you. Over to you, uh, Professor Zhang. Thank you so much, Steve, for inviting me and for hosting the event and also many thanks for your kind introduction. And thank you all for coming. I really look forward to some productive discussions today. Let me share my screen first. Okay, here you go. My talk today is intended to give an overview of my recent book, Anxious China, in the Revolution and the Politics of Psychotherapy, published by UC Press. I have the image of my book. The cover, I just want to say a few words, is artwork by a very talented artist, Chinese artist Hong Zhang, named Braided Field. And I saw this picture, I, it immediately caught my attention. I feel like it really captures the mood I want to carry in this book, Anxiety and the Restless. So today I hope also to take a closer look at one of the issues regarding the rise of a therapeutic self to give you a sense of how I, as an anthropologist, approach this complex subject of psychotherapy through ethnographic fieldwork. And I know Zoom events can be exhausting, so I'm gonna keep my talk uh, under just about 40 minutes to allow more time for Q&A. China's economic reform has brought about profound ruptures in not only socioeconomic structures, but also people's inner landscape. The National Center for Health, Mental Health actually, estimated that over 100 million Chinese people are suffering from different kinds of mental illness today. Faced with relentless market competition, rapid social change, and pressure to become successful chenggong, many Chinese people today are feeling unsettled and distressed. So some are turning to psychological counseling to grapple with their problems in hope for a quick fix. In this context, a new language, a therapeutic language of self-care and self-mastery, along with a very medicalized language of managing anxiety, depression, and stress, is emerging in Chinese society. So these are very much medicalized terms when you add the word zhen. As a reporter once put it, quote, this is a radical shift in a nation where focus on the individual was largely discouraged by both socialist ideology and the traditional culture, unquote. So my book is an ethnographic account of how a new inner revolution is unfolding in urban China. As my research shows that this is a bottom up popular psychological movement Okay, so it's not a top down by the state. And this inner revolution is profoundly reconfiguring the self, family dynamics, social relationships, and the modes of governing. I call this phenomena inner revolution, in order to highlight its transformative impact on so many aspects of life, even though it's still in its early stage of development. Unlike some other revolutions you have heard, the cultural revolution, the consumer revolution, and so on, this inner revolution is relatively quiet. 
but it engenders profound changes from within. In the midst of a thriving therapeutic culture, a host of Chinese work units, Danwei, such as schools, enterprises, the police, and the military are increasingly keen to incorporate psychological techniques into their personnel management when these organizations also face multiple challenges today. Therefore, psychological counseling is not limited to the reshaping of the individual and the family, uh, but also extends to governmental practices and broader social domains in the revolution I demonstrate is simultaneously uh, personal, but also political, intimate, but also social, subtle yet powerful. Be for this reason, in the book, my ethnographic gaze travels from clinical space to broader social spaces such as family, school and workplace. So it's not just limited to psychotherapy, clinical practices or hospitals. Now, let me first say a few words about the context for my research. Since the early 1990s, a side fever, Xinli Re, has been sweeping Chinese cities. It includes a broad range of things such as the teaching and the learning of psychology, group and individual counseling, self-help and cultivating happiness workshops and other mental health concerns. Numerous books and magazines on mental health and psychotherapy have been published. And also there is a burgeoning regime of private counseling centers, training workshops and websites on psychological well-being. For example, this is a most popular psychology magazine, as you can see, it's catered for middle class, urban middle class professional women. This is one of the training centers. These are young, uh, young uh, women who just acquired their license after they passed the national exam. At the center is the instructor. International experts are also invited to lecture uh, to large crowds of Chinese who are eager to learn uh, how to escape em emotional pain and attain the good life. This is Harvard's lecturer, Ben Shaha, talking to Chinese. Usually his lecture is very expensive and it will, will attract a thousand to two thousand people in the big theater. While the majority of such efforts are directed at middle-class urbanites, some marginalized social groups, for example, laid off workers, are also subject to some kind of a, a therapeutic intervention initiated by the government. So this therapeutic term here forms a stark contrast to the time under Maoist regime when psychiatry and psychology were largely non-existent and considered a, a useless and a harmful bourgeois intervention. So I have a chapter in the book tracing the early emergence and the later developments of psychology in China, if you're interested. So how do we explain this significant shift in the way people manage their well-being, endure distress, and recast selfhood when family bonds and social ties today become increasingly fragile? How can it be that a popular psi fever has taken hold in China at this particular historical moment? So in my book, I explore the causes, logics, and ramifications of this expanding therapeutic culture. So you notice my book is titled Anxious China because I argue that among various forms of mood disorder, anxiety, jiao lu, here broadly construed in both medical and social terms has become a key indicator of the pulse of contemporary Chinese society. So over the past two decades, it has come to my attention that people in China of diverse social strata 
are experiencing not only medically defined anxiety, but also widespread social anxiety for a number of reasons. So here I won't go into the detail, but uh, we can talk about it in Q&A and also it's in the book about the triggers, the social economic triggers. This sense of edginess is particularly palpable in China today because this society has been undergoing decades of profound structural and cultural transformations. So it's in this particular cultural milieu that I examine how this new psychotherapeutic culture take roots, thrives, and transforms across a broad range of social and political domains. Now, before I, turn, before I turn to the content of the book, let me also say a few words about my fieldwork and the personal experience that inspired me to write this book. So I'm an anthropologist, right? So fieldwork, ethnographic fieldwork is the cornerstone of our research. From 2010 to 2018, I conducted extensive fieldwork in the capital city of Kunming, uh, that's the capital of Yunnan province. Uh, Kunming has evolved over time uh, from a relatively poor borderland city into a regional hub of tourism, commerce, and international trades in the southwest. Uh, also, it's also my hometown where I grew up and did extensive research for my previous book on housing, city planning, and the middle class living. So during my field work, I was able to sit in a dozen of a private counseling sessions, either individual counseling or family counseling, and participate in numerous psychotherapy training workshops. Um, I also followed several key therapists for many years who became my key informants, and I participated in a lot of uh, uh, enterprise uh, training for their employees. If you have a chance to read this book, you will also see that this is a deeply personal project, unlike my previous two books. I think this one is really close to my heart. I've tried in the book to incorporate my own encounter with anxiety a few years ago after the passing of my mother. I've also tried to incorporate my own family history, especially my late mother's uh, uh, long-term suffering concerning mood disorders, as well as some stories of my close Chinese friends. So these lived experiences opened up a rare opportunity for me to connect with my informants and understand their emotional pains in a much deeper and intimate way. Now, let me turn to the three central issues my book addresses, and I'll follow uh, all these discussions with an ethnographic example. So these are the three central themes of the book. The first one concerns the crucial role of culture in therapeutic encounters. Psychotherapy took hold and spread in China so quickly, largely because it's regarded as a potential answer to myriad social and personal problems that needs to be addressed. Now, the key step to make imported psychotherapy work in China is through this process called the Bentuhua, namely, Psy practitioners must strive to make globally circulated psychotherapy comprehensible for their Chinese clients and suitable for their social and cultural sensibilities. So Bentuhua is not just an intellectual project, but part and parcel of the broad effort to tackle a host of difficult issues facing Chinese individuals, families, and organizations today. And it's also not a simple translation, but a complex and dialogic process during which Chinese practitioners must select, rework, and make sense of different strands of therapeutic practices, right? There are many strands and traditions of why do Chinese therapists choose certain ones but not others. I discuss in great detail why among many branches of psychotherapy, 
Chinese therapists selected, selectively embrace and rework three of them. So these are the three popular approaches. The first one is the Satya family therapy model. Second, cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. And the third, Yongyang inspired sand play therapy. So for example, uh, here I'm trying to show why, how each of them is connected with some kind of elements of Chinese cultural practices. For example, the core of the popular Satya family therapy is to situate what appears to be the individual's problems in the larger family system, rather than isolating the problems and trouble solely by focusing on the individual. Uh, Satya, Virginia Satya, who invented this uh, therapeutic model. Um, she was an American psychotherapist. And her books, many of her books have been translated into Chinese and they are very popular. So this model makes sense to many Chinese counseling clients. The therapist I spoke to suggest that the strong preference for family-oriented therapy is largely shaped by a long-standing Chinese cultural expectation of the self as a social self. One's obligation to his or her home family and collective-oriented ethics. My research shows that while, however, the Satya family model resonates well with most Chinese people's thinking about the role of the family in shaping an individual. In practice, it is very difficult to secure family participation due to time pressure, financial limits, gendered understanding of parental responsibilities and emotional care. So in the book, I have several cases talking about why parents, especially uh, fathers, are reluctant to participate in the therapy of their children, uh, even though it's necessary and very important. Another example for Ben Tu Hua uh, is making the connection between cognitive behavior therapy and a longstanding socialist practice known as thought work, Zuo. So the gist of a CBT is to use psychosocial intervention to help clients develop better coping strategies by modifying their dysfunctional thinking and their behavior patterns. That's the basic principle. Although the content and aim of thought work differ greatly from those of CBT treatments, one can still identify some interesting parallels between the two interventions. In fact, the three therapists I interviewed brought this to my attention because all of them uh, had been in the profession of doing thought work at universities or state enterprises before turning into therapists. So I thought it was very interesting. They found the CBT a good fit with the way Chinese people think about the relationship between thought and the behavioral change, even though their focus on CBT work now is not a political ideology or political persuasion, but rather on promoting personal growth and tackling emotional problems and the family problems. The communication skills they had learned from previous thought work can be applied to talk therapy easily, particularly they claim their ability to listen attentively okay, and then persuade people uh, for behavior change, that skill is very useful. So we can talk a little bit more about this in the Q&A. The second theme I discuss in the book is therapeutic governing. Some researchers have argued that the modern welfare states tend to normalize the marginalized social groups by subjecting them to the help of health experts and social workers. The basic assumption is that these people cannot govern their own life or adjust to the demands of increasingly stressful everyday life and therefore they need help, expert help. Uh, 
For example, psychiatrist Thomas Zass depicted an even more dystopic image of the therapeutic state encroaching deeply into civic life, including the health and the soul of people. So here I instead want to adopt a more nuanced approach. The notion, you know, I use the notion therapeutic governing to reveal how psychiatric and psychological interventions are used here by both state and the non-state authorities to shape, regulate, and manage the conduct of individuals and social groups in a very subtle way that many uh, citizens are willing to embrace because they see some benefits in that and they find it appealing. For example, under recent political regime, a preferred style of governing is uh, through the notion guan ai, uh, loving care. So rather than through the rule of domination and the political control. Now, what is guang ai, right? One of the ways in which kindly care, loving care is practiced is by integrating psychological care and education into personnel management for the military, the police, uh, schools, and other state-owned enterprises. Now, the goal here is to create stable, resilient, and the efficient subjects. Now here's a picture of a police training camp using psychological techniques to train their new recruits. Another picture is a local large uh, state-owned enterprises hiring a psychotherapist, training their employees so they can be more efficient and happier, not grumpy workers. Uh, in the book, I also have uh, an example of a paramilitary hospital in Kunming that used the psychological testing to screen new soldiers and establish psychological profiles for future use in case of promotion and so on. So now soldiers uh, are also offered the counseling and training, especially using positive psychology to enhance their psychological resilience so that they can deal with trauma and stress better. Many of these soldiers are deployed to uh, disaster relief work, right? So the incorporation of therapeutic techniques into organizational life like this one, in the name of care, is transforming how governing is carried out in China and how citizens are reshaped and managed from the inside out. But the reality is often more complicated. These therapists, especially those who work in the military and the police, are usually also party members and have to negotiate their dual role to fulfill their political loyalty to the party and to protect their clients' privacy. And it's a, a tall order. It's very hard to do. Now, let me turn to the third theme therapeutic self. Uh, this is just one more picture of state-owned enterprises uh, working with a prominent psychologist there. The third theme of the book is the emergence of the therapeutic self. Uh, it, this is a mode of self created with the aid of psychotherapeutic engagement through either private counseling, group counseling, or self-help. So here I ask, why is the self granted the extraordinary salience among the middle class today? What specific projects of self-development and self-care are emerging? So as you know, the question of selfhood, the self-cultivation has a long genealogy in Chinese history. So here I don't have time to get in, but in the book, I treat some important continuities and the discontinuities from the dawn of the 20th century to Mao, Maoist socialism to the post-Mao period. But uh, what I want to point out here is that unlike the past, uh, self-cultivation today has become a technical matter involving psychological experts intervention. So this is rather 
uh, new to China. And uh, theoretically, I'm very much influenced by Foucault's notion of the technologies of the self, you know, namely practices that seek to transform oneself through a number of operations on their bodies, thoughts, and the conduct. But I also want to argue in the book that such technologies are very much historically and culturally conditioned. So I uh, borrowed Nicholas Rowe's extensive study of what he calls the psychological complex in England. And I wanna show here that the self, along with Nicholas Rowe's notion, the self is not a pre-given, of course. Instead, it's formed through social recognition and negotiations with one's own social obligations and the cultural norms. So in China, the making of the self, the remaking of the self is further complicated by multiple existing expectations and ethics. Uh, briefly, if we want to group them, we can call them the traditional set and socialist and neoliberal. And over the past two decades, this socially embedded selfhood has been undergoing profound transformations. Yet the search for zi-wo, self, is still very much entangled with one's social obligations, socialist ethics, and the prevailing cultural values. So my ethnographic account unravels this constant articulation of the self and the social, right? It's not one or the other, but it's an articulation. So here, let me give you one ethnographic example of this uh, dual process, I call it the dual process involving distangling and re-embedding how this process works. Um, this is just a uh, picture of a boy in a sand play therapy session. And this is a typical sand play training workshops. I also went through one of these workshops and got certified along with other people. But this case I want to talk about is very special. So one day at a sand therapy training workshop, I met Feng Gang. I don't have his face here uh, for privacy. Okay. I met Feng Gang, a distressed 35-year-old police officer who was going through a great deal of anxiety and confusion um, because of the growing tensions with his supervisor and family. He sought psychotherapy training to deal with his own social dilemma and emotional turmoil. So we later became good friends because we shared a special moment when I was a training session like this, and I was assigned as his therapist in a simulated stand play therapy session. The arrangement he created was very telling. This is the sandbox arrangement he made. It was a desert scene with a red snake that appeared to be stranded in the sand. Nearby, there was a cluster of green cactus here and a jade horn symbolizing hope, green cactus, like a oasis. It took him a long time to put this simple thing together. Then he said softly, quote, I feel that the snake is very lonely and stuck there. It's trying to move towards the green plants, perhaps an oasis in the desert, but it's very tired and will probably never get there, unquote. So I asked carefully, does this thing speak to your situation? He nodded and tears came rolling down. He said, this snake is just like me. I never had a chance to look at myself like this before. I was somewhat shaken at first because I did not expect to encounter such an emotionally charged situation. I then learned that Feng Gang was a plain clothed policeman responsible for catching pocket pickers on city buses. So his work was highly demanding and sometimes dangerous, yet his supervisor did not trust him and accused him of slacking off. And when Feng Gang began to take counseling classes in his spare time, he had to hide it from his supervisors and coworkers. At work front, uh, at home front, it was also difficult for him. Uh, he had a newborn baby at home. His parents-in-law uh, lived with his family. 
but they questioned why a man like him wanted to study psychology and disparaged him frequently. So Fong looked depressed, but never went to see a psychiatrist or got a diagnosis, partly because mental illness was still very largely stigmatized and partly because he thought he could just toughen up, right? As many men thought they could just toughen up. Yet he was slipping into deeper and deeper isolation and the depression. This feeling of bewilderment was a main factor pulling him towards psychological training. So he cherished this group training sessions that gave me a safe private space to look deeper into his own psyche and dilemma, attending his own anguish and opening up his feeling to others in the group training session was a first step towards healing. So I call this form of intimate yet still social <coughs> therapeutic space, psychosociality, right? It's like this space. It's private, small, but it's safe. And in a way, it's social. Fong later offered me his reflection on self-work like this, quote, zi wo self has two layers of meanings. One is the dang xia de wo, the self that's living here and now, which is deeply embedded in a family, king, and society. The other, the pristine self, he calls yuan shi de wo, detached from the reality, which emerges from time to time when I'm alone in meditation. I'm longing for the disentangled self, but at the same time, I cannot abandon the socially embedded self because both together makes me human, unquote. So here, disentangling refers to detaching oneself through therapy temporarily and mentally from one's family, workplace, and other social world. <clears throat> Uh, Re-embedding refers to the subsequent return to the social nexus after therapeutic self-work. So in my view, Fong's statement is very powerful because it highlights the complexity of the self as relational and dynamic, constantly being constituted and reconstituted through these different layers of sociality and the personal desires. You know, one always has to negotiate both uh, forces there. Two years later, we met again. Fong's mood and the personal circumstances had improved greatly. He continued to study psychotherapy and practice self-cultivation. At the same time, uh, he was more engaged with his family and volunteered to give free counseling services to school children uh, with emotional troubles. <clears throat> so he looked much happier. I think in this case, you really can see how he uh, did this dual process of disentangling and re-embedding. And of course, this is not a one-step process. It's a constant back and forth dialogic process. <clears throat> Throughout my field work and the writing of this book, I have maintained a deeper sense, a deep sense of ambivalence towards side fever and psychotherapy. On the one hand, there is the risk to psychologize a host of social and economic problems that are derived from and demand structural change, right? We definitely see this trend and uh, risk, and this is not about China, it's a general critique of psychotherapy <clears throat> that you tend to psychologize everything. Psychotherapy can be thus used as a political tool to neutralize hegemonic, naturalize hegemonic ideologies by turning our attention to the individual psyche. For example, in the case of the enterprise training, it seems all the problems they are facing, the employees are facing, uh, are said to be uh, in, in inner in individual and can be managed by individuals rather than you know looking at the, the structural problems. On the other hand, psychological intervention can provide 
much needed relief and hope for those who are struggling with emotional anguishes and longing for a better life. Therefore, I feel that it's better and important to, to treat this therapeutic turn seriously by discerning both its promises and shortfalls, claims and unintended consequences, you know, rather than dismissing that as some kind of a bourgeois or brainwashing efforts. If anxiety is a general symptom of a society in distress, the aim of my book is to offer a glimpse of how individuals, families, and organizations grapple with this condition. It's also my hope that the stories that I present in my book will convey not only anxiety, fears, and the pain of the people who shared their life with me, but also aspirations, hopes, and resilient spirits in their search for the good life in the midst of these massive societal transformations. Finally, I want to say a few words about COVID and the pandemic period. Anxious China, my book, was published in August 2020. That's uh, the, we can call the early stage of the pandemic. And the entire world at that time had just entered the COVID-19 pandemic. And this pandemic has lasted over two years and we're still in the midst of it. China's zero COVID policy served the country relatively well uh, in the, uh, let's say 2020-2021 until the rapid spread of the Omicron varied hit the country and this strategy started to fall apart. Some of you may be following the news, right? So we see massive and unpredictable lockdowns, uh, Xi'an, uh, some other places, but now uh, Shanghai, the massive Shanghai lockdown, took a huge toll on not only the country's economy, but also Chinese people's mental health. There's no doubt uh, COVID-19, the pandemic has a huge impact on the Chinese population's mental health. The anxiety, uh, the anxiety level <clears throat> and the need for psychotherapeutic help has been rising steeply more than ever. So this is something I've been uh, following online. Um, perhaps, you know, we can talk about this during the Q&A. Uh, uh, I can only say that, you know, I little did I know when the book came out, Anxious China, uh, that now, uh, yes, <laughs> it's very fitting. I think China and the world is very much in the age of anxiety. And there's so much work that needs to be done, right? So. Well, thank you all for listening, and I really look forward to questions and discussions. Yeah. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lee, for this amazingly thoughtful and uh, insightful presentation. Before I open it to the floor, I would like to ask you, kick off the seminar with, with, a, with, with, with a question about um, the kind of issues that you have found in China through your field work, the kind of anxiety that you have discovered with your um, sessions, are they really the kind of common anxieties that people face in the 21st century, whether they are in China or in uh, the Bay Area in California or in London or in Delhi or elsewhere, or how much of it is actually very China specific? And China specific in, in particular related to its political and social and economic systems and the kind of particular type of pressure that people found because of the particular socio political economic conditions in which they lived and work. Yeah. Great question, Steve. Yeah, very, very good question. I think, you know, on one level, you can say that the anxieties they experience or the expression of their anxieties share a lot in common with people elsewhere. But if you look deeper, the triggers 
and the context in which these anxieties arise, I think are more specific. Some of the issues are more specific to Chinese society. For example, I talk about in the book, several major factors of forces that gave rise to these anxieties and the inner revolution. Uh, one of them, for example, uh, is food safety issues. It continues to be a problem, but especially a few years ago, food safety is a big problem that people feel unsafe to consume a lot of food. There's this awful uh, report about the Digo Yu, the, the restaurants were using really uh, recycle the oils in the ditches and refine them and cook food. And there are a lot of uh, practices that they put uh, harmful chemicals in vegetables in order to make them look bigger and nicer. So food safety is a big issue in China that caused a lot of uh, anxieties. I'm not saying that other places don't have, but it was very intense in China. I think it continues to be a problem when we go to outside to consume food in China or buy food in China. And another thing that was unique to China earlier on was the uh, air pollution. Um, some of you may have watched this uh, documentary uh, under the dome talking about the awful traumatic <laughs> air index uh, impact on people's lives. You know, for a while, the movie talks about it. every morning people get up in Beijing, they'll look at their air quality index and their mood will be literally affected by the index level because sometimes it will hit 500 and that's unimaginable. You know, here when we have uh, over 200, that's considered very bad, right? But in more recent years, I think the government has done something to uh, improve the air quality. So that problem seems to be getting better. However, Beijing's getting better, but other places are, are not necessarily getting better air. So, so that's another. So my point is that I think I think that's a good question. So always think about what is unique to China, but what is more commonly shared. And I think there are specific social economic conditions that gave rise to their um, anxieties. But if you look at the expression, yes, you can probably say, well, yeah, they, they look similar in terms of anxiety, right, uh, shared by people. And then another one, I think, Steve, you mentioned about young people, the enormous pressure shared by Chinese youth today, largely because many of these are singletons, dushenzi, and they shoulder tremendous family pressure and expectation on them. They have to perform. They always have to be the, hopefully, the top 10% of their class, but then what, what are you going to do with the 90%? So these kids are under a lot of pressure. They are under the pressure to perform and um, they cannot, they don't have the choice to exit this enormous pressure. I think Xiang Biao also write about this in revolution. Kids felt as a, I think, response to that, you mentioned the Tangping lying flat. I think it's a really Chinese youth resistance strategy. So say, okay, I cannot exit this relentless competition, but can I just lie down? <laughs> I refuse to participate. But that seems to be not a choice either. Um, so yeah, so there are some factors more unique to China than other places. Yeah. Thank you. We already got quite a few very, very good, interesting questions. But I'll also continue to encourage anyone of you who would like to raise any questions to use the Q&A box. It will be helpful if you provide some indication as to who or where who you are or where you are. But if you would like to stay anonymous, just indicate at the beginning of your uh, questions, and I will respect that. The first question I pick for you, uh, Professor Zhang, is from Dr. Jennifer Bond, an alumni of SOAS. Okay. And she says, thank you for a fascinating talk. I was wondering if you can say more about the certification for counselors in China. Do they have to be approved or registered with a national or state controlled body? What are counselors allowed to disclose by law? In the case of the UK, for example, I believe it's only if 
people uh, planning acts of self-violence or terrorism, can a counselor break confidentiality? Uh, do religious groups provide counseling services? And she's somebody looking to read your book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All oh, very interesting questions. Yes, I can uh, explain briefly here and many of them are addressed also in the book. So certification process is very uh, interesting in China. It's very unique. I call it a global kind of like assembly line type of uh, training for getting the certification. So these young people usually will go through a three month intensive uh, training study periods. They study several subjects, child psychology, development psychology, very uh, compact training. And then they will go to take this national examination to get certified and a lot of memorization involved. And it's not very difficult to get that certification, right? The problem is that many of them can pass and get the national certification. However, they are far from being able to practice. And that's why a lot of them have to go to more advanced training. And it also turns out, my book uh, shows that many of them are not interested in becoming a psychotherapist. They take the training and the exam as a way of learning psychotherapy and the counseling systematically in order to help themselves and their families. And they argue that this is actually cheaper, even though you have to pay several thousand kwai to go through this process, but they want to learn the tool to help themselves. And it's cheaper than going to see a counselor because the hourly rate is very, very high in China today. In Kunming, it's about 500 to 800 yuan per hour. And that's, that's a lot of money because an ordinary teacher probably makes 4,000 yuan uh, a month, right? So you can, you can imagine that. Okay, but uh, one quick thing I want to uh, note is that this national certification pro uh, program actually was canceled a few years ago by the state and it threw the whole country into chaos. People were not sure what's going on. Um, I think the rationale was that they could, uh, the government is gonna decentralize this process. Eventually, hopefully, uh, provincial government, state government will be in charge of professionalization of the consulate rather than the state. Confidentiality is a big issue. Um, they are required to protect the privacy and that's their cardinal rule. But when do you reveal certain information? Uh, I think only when they feel it's going to threaten the client's life, uh, they would only uh, do so, reveal or make suggestions that suggest that the client to go to see a psychiatrist. But um, otherwise, most of them would not report, except for the military and the police. That is very hard. They have to report certain issues when they encounter. That's why I mentioned the dilemma they're facing them. And finally, quickly, uh, religious organizations, some of them began to provide counseling services. I know some of the uh, 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 Christian and the ca Catholic organizations, they sent uh, some of their employees to go through this kind of a psychological training in order to help their uh, clients. So yeah, it is being in integrated into some of the religious organizations. But thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, next question I pick comes from Graham Hutchins in Oxfordshire. What does the Communist Party have to say in its doctrines and ideology about the self and mental well-being? On the surface, it would seem that CBT might have a bigger role to play in the happiness of the Chinese people than fidelity to Marxism, Leninism, and Xi Jinping thought. Would you agree? Um, let's see. I didn't quite uh, understand the question. So what is the party's doctrine about the self? And the yes, what, what does the party think about the self in terms of its ideology and its doctrine about yeah. the self and about mental health. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yes, I, I guess, you know, 
for the party, even though today we're in a very different time, but as far as the party is concerned, the doctrine of the Communist Party about self is that always the self, you don't have a private self. The self is always a social self and the self always serves the greater society and well-being of the society and uh, serve the party, right? That's very clear. So I think from the party's perspective, the self always should be subjugated or eclipsed by the party state's demand and the collective's needs. And that, that's usually the case. So that's why uh, I am in the beginning a bit of surprised that this enterprise is the party actually allows psychotherapy and psychological counseling to even enter these organizations because it kind of runs against the party's notion, right, of self and self's relationship to the social. But I think the party is also changing, I guess it realized because the party used to do a lot of thought work and everything. People just get so bored of it and they turn deaf, eye to, deaf ear to it. So the party wants to figure out some ways that can incorporate these techniques uh, into their work to create efficient, resilient human beings. So I think for the party, it's a big compromise. It's a big compromise to even allow psychology and psychotherapy to be integrated into uh, governing techniques. However, I think I mentioned a little bit, only certain brands of psychology uh, are used, particularly positive, positive psychology and the satya kind of upbeat, socially oriented psychology uh, can be integrated, but not Freudian, for example, that type of psychology and some other psychology. Yeah. Next question comes from uh, Rosita from Lithuania. Does the political system and framework of China add to the high anxiety level in China? In your research, could you see what or when was the breaking point when the anxiety level started shooting up in China? Mm. Mm -hmm. So when does the anxiety level start to shoot up in China? Um, I, there are a couple of things, right? I think I did notice in more recent years, so I would say since 2000, as the economic reform deepens and the social inequality skyrockets in China, that's another big factor trigger is the inequality and the pressure for people to perform right people are always now afraid of falling behind falling from grace there is a book in america calling falling from grace the middle class has a great deal of anxiety of falling behind the other people so in this context i start to see anxiety level shot up but another factor i must say is that also when this language, medicalized language of anxiety, depression, enters China. People started to have a language to grasp on, to describe their suffering. That also contribute to the uh, prevalence, I think, of anxiety. So there are two levels. One is that uh, researchers always deal with this. How, how do we know is that actual cases rise or it's because, because of reporting, because people have the language to describe and also uh, maybe it's getting uh, diagnosed and reported, right? So we, we, we are never fully sure, but I think both of them contribute to the skyrocketing of anxiety and depression. Is one is they have the language and the diagnosis, but also the actual uh, experience, existential experience all contributed, I would say since the 2000, yeah, uh, I began to see more and more of uh, anxiety and depression in China. Uh, what about the earlier question about the political system and does that affect the mental health and anxiety? Mm. The political system, it's interesting. I, I heard earlier you said that the uh, people who are the person who asked question for Lithuania, right? I have uh, some very close- That's friends. That is the question from the, the lady from Lithuania. 
yeah, yeah. I think it's very interesting. I understand, you know, especially in the previously socialist countries and now China, we call it post-socialist, whatever it is, but it's still a largely socialist countries. And I do uh, believe that the political system also contribute to the level of anxiety, um, particularly, you know, uh, uh, let's say authoritarian state, right? And if you look at the lockdown today, the policy, even though the state claims it is for the greater benefits for the population as a whole. So it is okay for some cities and some individuals to suffer a bit, to endure hardship of lockdown for the well-being of the whole country. So that's their, their rationale. But uh, because of that, uh, gee, you know, I've been following the Shanghai lockdown. The amount of uh, sacrifice and human suffering in this period it, it is extraordinary. And I think largely because of uh, the policy, the zero COVID policy by a authoritarian state, right? So, um, so yeah, I think the political system does contribute to that. Okay, let's see, yeah. um, next question comes from Cindy Gao, who is a student, uh, postgraduate student at SOAS. Therapeutic governing seems to have some elements of a top down phenomenon in that people in leadership positions use psychological interventions and self reflection on others. How do you reconcile this with the bottom up nature of your inner revolution? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Yes. So, as, as a whole, the phenomenon, the Sai fever, Xingli Zhe, I described here, I said it's more bottom up because there's demand that the urban middle class professionals, they encounter issues, they want to solve their problems, so say they seek counseling, right? So in that sense, it is bottom up. But when you go to organizations, then you start to see a bit top down, meaning, um, some of this, so in one of those organizations I went, it's a big tobacco company. So the factory organized this uh, retreat, it's called retreat at a five star resort to encourage their employees to attend. Many of them were not willing to. So they named some, they think potentially troublemakers to attend the uh, workshop by giving them incentives. They get time off, they get uh, all these banquets, uh, five-star uh, resorts and stuff as incentives. They can't really force them to go, but they provide incentives for them to participate. But once they are there, I began to talk with the employees. It's very interesting. A lot of them said when they first came, they were like kind of reluctant. It's something you know from the top. They were suspicious about that. But once they were there, they began over time to enjoy it because of the content. They were happily surprised that they were not there to study political documents and all these other thought works. They were actually given very helpful techniques to manage their own mental health and to deal with their family issues, including meditation and some other things. So, so they, bottom-up movement does not completely preclude the top-down efforts. However, it is, even though you can call this a top-down, but it's not a forced upon, there are techniques to incentivize employees to participate. And once they are there, they become more willing participants there. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. It's much more nuanced than, than a black and white picture here. Thank you. Right, let me... Pick the next question, which comes from uh, Dr. Norman Stockman in Aberdeen, Scotland. The sources of psychotherapy you discuss are mainly modern, scientific, and Western. Are there also attempts to draw the traditional Chinese philosophies, for example, the Zhuangzi, mm -hmm. to understand and deal with the anxieties you have identified? Thank you for bringing this up because I didn't have a chance to even talk about this. 
But that's precisely, I think, what you said here. Uh, why most of them, like the Satya family model and CBT, are more modern scientific imported from the West, uh, people, psychotherapists in China, also have begun to incorporate more traditional Chinese cultural philosophy and practice this. And one of the areas you can see this most obviously is in the third uh, therapeutic model I talk about, the Jungian inspired scent play uh, therapy. Um, that one actually uh, is the closest to traditional Chinese culture and philosophy. So in the book, I describe the reasons, right? So Jung himself uh, was deeply influenced by Chinese and Indian traditional philosophy and the culture. For example, Yi Jing, he read Yi Jing. He wrote a preface to a, a German translation of Yi Jing. He, was a strong admirer of traditional Chinese cultural uh, practices. And then the inventor of a scent play therapy, uh, Carol Dorf, uh, she was a young student and she herself was very much influenced by traditional Chinese culture. So uh, Chinese therapists, some of them are very interested in scent play therapy, uh, largely because of this uh, cultural affinity they find it very familiar and easier to uh, apply that to their Chinese clients. So yes, there is a great deal of uh, uh, what I call the blending or hybrid model, right? Using traditional Chinese practices and the philosophy to explain things in the so-called now Western psychotherapy. So it's not uh, just the Western psychotherapy. There is a great deal of effort of uh, uh, hybridity uh, uh, going on there. Yeah, so the book has more information if you're interested. Thank you. Okay, next question I pick it comes from uh, Mexico, from Adriana Martinez Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. um, has Xi Jinping's daughter, who studied psychology, managed to make an impact and cause any change in the top? party cadre's ways of dealing with mental health or the importance they attach to mental health, particularly during the COVID lockdown years? Right. Well, great question. I wish I, I, wish I knew. I don't know. I, I heard the rumors that she was studying psychology at Harvard and all this. So uh, people are talking about that and hoping that she would have some impact uh, on that. But uh, I, I, yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know about the details. So we can right. <laughs> Yes. Well, I thought it was a, worth a, a try. I'll, yeah. I'll get back a bit more to that contrast between the Chinese and the Western approach. And this question comes from Ray Sato. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that CBT matched Chinese understanding of psych psyche and behavior. What things do you think bridge Western and Chinese understanding of them? In other words, what philosophical or political elements share in common when it comes to understanding of psyche and behavior? Mm -hmm. Also, even there is China specific anxieties or cultural specific anxieties. CBT tends to be chosen for the treatment. Do you think it has greater efficacy or should one be dismissing cultural values? Hmm. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> a very complex question. Well, CBT and the uh, uh, tradition, I mean, and the ch Chinese way of thinking about behavioral change and the psyche. I think in both the cases, you know, like I mentioned, uh, thought work, right? Socially thought work. The gist of thought work is also that that one can change one's behavior by changing your ways of looking at things and thinking about things. So your attitude and your way of perceiving the world can directly impact your behavior. Now in the CBT is your psyche. There's a clear connection between your cognition, see cognition 
and your behavior changes. So in that sense, they're not completely the same, but there is a, both believe in this connection between how you think and perceive the world and uh, engendering behavior changes. So there's that link there. Um, then let's see, evidence, yeah. So CBT in, I don't know about in UK, but in North America, CBT is a preferred treatment modality by all insurance companies because it claims that CBT is evidence-based. It can produce results relatively in a relatively short period of time. So insurance companies would allow, for example, 10 sessions and hope that it would generate evidence of change, positive change. While other modalities of psychotreatment usually requires months and months and even years of intensive treatment, which is really costly. And we can't really say whether uh, it generates the results, right? However, in the international community, psychotherapy communities, whether CBT really is more effective, efficacious, um, that's still debatable though. That's still debatable. Uh, it's not a, a foregone conclusion, right? Um, but because of that reason, it's more preferred. And then in China, uh, insurance doesn't, most insurance does not cover any of this therapy. So it's not so much the insurance cost matter in China, but Chinese people do. In my chapter, I write about the, the, the psychotherapy with Chinese characteristics. Chinese clients, most likely, they when they come, they demand results too. They want, uh, they want the psychotherapist to tell them what to do, what they can do. And then they want to see the results very quickly. They are not going to come back again and again. So because of that reason, CBT, I think, also fulfills that desire for quick uh, uh, results and action. So I don't know whether I answered your question. It's a very complicated question you presented here, but yeah, those are some of the thoughts. The well, next question comes from a completely different angle. It comes from a med medical doctor, uh, Dominic Stevens. I'm a doctor who relied heavily on prescribing medicines for, in quotation marks, life problems partly because of the time constraints, but also because antidepressants seem to work, though anti-anxiety medications are fraught with dangers. Are you concerned by this? And I will add to that, is this a problem that is even more acute in China or not? Mm, okay, yeah, very good question. Um, I totally understand where you come from, right? So in China, if you go to a psychiatrist for your issues, most likely the doctor will talk to you for 10 minutes and then give you one of the SSRI antidepressants, mm -hmm. whatever, Zoloft, uh, Selexa, so one of those, you know, Prozac. So that's how they do it because precisely they said they don't have time to talk and they're not trained in psychotherapy either. So it's a quick diagnosis and then give you medication. And, and also in the book, I describe one of the episodes I went with my mother. Uh, these doctors are swamped by patients. They have to see 60 patients a day. They give you seven minutes each patient. So seven minutes, the intake, is just really quick and then they prescribe a medicine. So that's a problem. So the, the other thing I'm describing in this book are mostly people, uh, Chinese people are very wary about uh, psychotropical medicines. They do not want to take it unless it's absolutely necessary. So a lot of them would struggle and deal with the issues. And then when they can't deal with that, they might find a psych psychotherapist to talk and hope a couple of sessions would help them solve their problem and they would do some behavioral cognitive changes. Only when the problem is so severe that they cannot solve through psychotherapy and the psychotherapist will probably refer them, say you need to see a psychiatrist to get medication. They will go to the psychiatrist to get medication. So uh, I am 
concerned for some of the people who just go to the psychiatrist and get a few minutes diagnosis and, and hand it in some kind of psychotropic medicines, uh, because they, as you say, there are serious side effects of those medicines. And particularly, they're not monitored by their psychiatrist. If you don't come back, nobody's going to call you to follow up. So it's all on you. And we all know that those medicines, particularly when you take them in the initial stage and for younger people, particularly young kids and but kids and young people, you need to monitor them because some, some of them might have suicidal thoughts and worsen their condition. So it is a big problem. It is a big problem. In China, just the sheer volume of people, uh, doctors, psychiatrists really understaffed that they cannot uh, follow up or do a two hour intake, intake session with, with a patient, not possible. So it's a huge problem in China. Okay. Next question from Lan Fang, who is a postgrad at SOAS. Could you please clarify with more details about how the Chinese authority practices governmental power over the population by means of self-making? Mm -hmm. Mm, I'm not quite sure what this question refers to, how the Chinese governmental, uh, could you repeat? I don't, I don't quite get the part of the question. Could you clarify with more details about how the Chinese authorities practices governmental power over the population by means of self-making? Mm, okay, okay, yeah. Um, I. I want to say, first of all, this whole business of self-care, self-making, right, is part of the urban middle class professionals uh, initiative and self, their effort to take care of themselves, to seek happiness, to live a good life, better life. Now, the uh, government comes into play in certain circumstances. Not that the government intentionally comes into these organizations to say, you know, I want you to do this, this, and remake yourself. Is that I would say in those cases of enterprise and the military, the government comes in with a different aim, right? To try to uh, train a more resilient, efficient workforce. But at the same time, that very effort impact on the way the self is shaped. So I would say that self-making and self-remaking definitely is a byproduct of many of the governmental efforts, but not necessarily the clear goal of the government. So it's a byproduct because how can you not change how you view yourself and your relationship with others by practicing all the stuff we described here, I described in the book, you know, uh, through the enterprise, through the military, the uh, police, the training. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know I mean, exactly what you're looking for, but that's my sense. It's, it's an inevitable by byproduct of a lot of this uh, intervention by organizations. Yeah. Next question is anonymous. I am wondering what are the consequences for people who suffer from mental health, other than lying flat, mm. can these individuals' sufferings generate larger scale resistance as transformative power against the structure which caused the mental health issues in the first instance? Mm. Mm -hmm. Great question. And also, my hope is that it might and maybe will. However, it is extremely difficult under the circumstance because of the very tight control by the party state in many ways. So whether the suffering will transform into you know, essentially your question, not just lying down as a form of resistance, but whether this kind of suffering can transform into some productive uh, forces, resistance forces. That uh, I think is an open-ended question. 
Uh, it's very hard to predict. I wish it would, but uh, so far it seems uh, not quite the case yet. However, in the recent case of Shanghai lockdown, we do see some sparks of this, right? So when some residents are under strict draconian measures and they really had to suffer in many different ways, um, some of the Shanghai residents did push back and made, made the government to change its measures and the policies. Not the whole entire lockdown policy, but some elements. So the government in certain cases backed down a little bit and not to pursue certain really extreme measures. So I do see a bit transformation of their suffering into distance and actually produce some results. Right. So uh, it, it does happen because in one example during the lockdown, um, the Shanghai government actually sent into teams into individual households to spray their houses in order to kill the virus and germs, which actually doesn't, doesn't help, but they decided to do that. So it destroyed a lot of people's like content of their computer, their clothing stuff. So it caused outrage among the Shanghai residents. And the government eventually decided not to do that. So after a few days and back down and not to do that. So it, that's, I think, a welcome sign, I think, for resistance, right? But nevertheless, they could not change the whole entire lockdown policy. Shanghai got 60 days lockdown. It's gradually emerging back, but the damage is huge. So, yeah. Next questions come from Katie Lee in Scotland. How are Chinese students coping if parents and young people are getting anxiety? How are the children doing? And I will attach to that another question from um, VJ, someone else, who asked you, what about people in the rural areas? Mm. So first one, uh, I think children are doing badly. I think according to some research, they did some kind of surveys that's even pre-pandemic in some Chinese cities among school-aged children. The percentage of the children who have suicidal thoughts is so high, it's startling. I think more than half or something like that. It's just shocking. They are not doing really well. And they are also under this tremendous pressure for Gaokao, the national college entrance exam, right? So not really well. And if their parents are suffering a lot of time, you know that. So uh, when parents have issues, children also absorb their anxiety and, and uh, worries, right? There's this intergeneration uh, tran transmission of uh, mental suffering, distress. So it's a huge, huge issue. And uh, most Chinese schools and colleges today have a counseling center now, office, but I think it's still uh, far understaffed and they need definitely more uh, workers in that area to help children. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem. I, I have to say though, having said that in the US, it's also a huge problem. I'm a professor, I'm teaching, you know, this 500 student class and many, many of them are dealing with the various kinds of issues. It's just really uh, sad and disheartening to see uh, how much struggle they are going through. So in that respect, it's not just China. Uh, rural area, I don't know a whole lot. I only know from secondary source research done by other researchers, and it's also a problem in the rural area, but I think uh, not enough research has been done in the rural area, except for a couple of people. So we don't know enough, perhaps, you know, some more research needs to be done in the rural area as well. Yeah. Um, next question I pick comes from uh, Jai Chen. How does this site FIFA addressing interpersonal relations interact with neoliberal feminism? And do you think there is a fetishization of 
emotional stability among the young urban Chinese. Hmm. Interesting. So, side fever in relation to new liberal time feminism. Yeah. Um, I have not done too much research on that topic, so I, I can't say how that relationship, how the two articulate with one another. But with regard to your question about whether there is a fetishism about emotional disability, uh, um, uh, stability, uh, perhaps, you know, I think once now you have the language and the awareness so people talk about that more. So it could become a fetishism. People are obsessed with one's emotional stability, emotional well-being, much more than before. But whether that's a good thing or not, I think before, because of the lack, because of the unaware of those issues, I feel it's actually good that people now are more aware of their mental condition emotional condition um, rather than just kind of a you know sailing blindly but of course we don't want that to go to the other extreme that people are so obsessed with that so it's a matter of balance you know to have mental health awareness know how to take care of one's own emotion and self but not go to the extreme be completely consumed and obsessed by that right so that's a I think that's a balance balance act. I still think China needs more, actually. A lot of people are not quite aware of, uh, of that yet. And then there's a huge social uh, cultural stigma about emotional disorder and the seeking help. And I actually think they need more awareness. I think we're just less than, uh, just over three minutes left. Um, one, I think one last question from Isabel Henry. Would you have a sense of how mental health and psychotherapy or psychiatry play out in the ethnic minority regions of the PRC, especially in the border regions where there is a lot of political control and contest? Mm -hmm. um, certainly, I. it's interesting. So in a way, I did not go out to study the ethnic dimension, but at the same time, you know, I did my research in Yunnan province, my Kunming. So even though Kunming is largely Han Chinese, but inevitably I also encountered some ethnic minority people in this process. And I myself, I'm Baizu, my, my father is from Dali. So I'm one of the ethnic minority groups. Um, the impact, so in my research, I have not seen the ethnic dimension as something really standing out. Um, so it's a, still largely for me when I did my research, a Han kind of Chinese phenomenon, although I did encounter a couple of people who are from the ethnic minority groups, um, but I cannot say that their issues are directly related to their status as ethnic people, right? But a colleague in Yunnan University there I encountered, she was doing research in one of the ethnic groups in the rural areas. And there's this uh, uh, Dulongchun, I think it's Dulongzu, Dulongzu. So this particular village ethnic groups has really high suicide rates. So she was trying to do some research in this group, but as you can see, you know, I was going to collaborate with her, go back to do some research, but then COVID happened, I couldn't go back. And also this is a pretty sensitive <laughs> issue uh, that's not very easy to get permission to do research, but I, I'm aware that she was doing some research there uh, in this particular ethnic group area. So I imagine it has something to do with the uh, more marginalized social economic conditions, the status of this particular group of people there. Um, but I, yeah, I cannot say too much uh, further about that. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm afraid that time is coming to a close. And I do apologize to those of you who have put questions in the Q&A box that I've not been able to put to our speaker.
but please be assured that all the questions will have been saved and they will be sent on to Professor Zhang so that she will know what question you have raised with her and whether she's, she's got any way to contacting you is a different matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just end this by thanking Professor Li Zhang of the University of California, Davis, for a very enlightening and insightful evening of conversations for us and for a morning conversation for you. Thank you so much, uh, Steve, and thank you for the wonderful stimulating questions. I will make sure that I read all of them and think about them. I do appreciate your participation and the thoughts. Thank you so much. And thank you also to all of you who have taken part in this uh, webinar. I hope to see a lot of you in our next and other future events. Goodbye. Bye-bye.